This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Just Asking Questions, which is also our first in-person episode since my co-host Liz Wolf and I live about 800 miles away. And we are pleased to welcome as our very first guest, podcaster extraordinaire, Dave Smith. Dave, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be uh, on the first episode. Well, we wanted to have you on the first episode because it kind of sets the tone for what we want to do, which is to engage people who are like, I don't know, 70, 80 percent in agreement with us, but then also explore. That, that's like I feel like that's a good starting place where we have enough common ground where we don't have to quibble about like the, the biggest picture questions, but we can really get down into the details about some of the finer points. So uh, we're we're very grateful to have you here today. Oh, my pleasure. So for our first question, I want to open this up to everybody, but we will obviously give our guests of honor the chance to answer first. What is a libertarian? What beliefs are disqualifying for libertarians to hold today? Yeah, I, well, I would say to me, libertarianism is the belief in self-ownership, private property rights, and the non-aggression principle. To me, I think that's the best philosophically sound definition of it that isn't circular, you know what I mean? That it's, it's not just like a definition like, well, I, it's someone who believes in freedom or so, you know, maximum freedom or something like that. Uh, so a libertarian would be someone to me who believes in that. Um, and I, I would argue that almost everyone who calls themselves a libertarian, whether they would agree with my definition or not, whenever they're arguing for a libertarian position, it's completely consistent with all of that. Now, what beliefs are disqualifying to you is tough to quibble about because I don't know, look like Gary Johnson, um, wanted to legalize pot, but not any other drugs or not any harder drugs. Please explain to me how you think that legalizing marijuana straight through to heroin can possibly be a harm reduction forum. It makes no sense to me. We are not espousing the legalization of any drugs outside of marijuana. I'm not going to say he's not a libertarian, um, but I would say he's not a libertarian on heroin if that makes sense, right? Like that's just, it's completely contradicts what libertarians believe. So I don't know exactly. I probably, there are probably some issues for me that- He if, seemed pretty blissed out. Like he might have been on heroin, who's to say? Yeah, no, I think it's just a lot of edibles, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but so I don't know, you know, everybody says like, you're not a real libertarian to every other libertarian. So I try to just not get involved in that. Although I will say there are certain things probably, you know, like to me, war and peace is the biggest issue. And people who support wars, I really do not consider them libertarians. I just think that it's like, if you are for freedom and against the government, there is no worse government policy in the world than war. It, there's not even a close second. And uh, that, you know, that's, you know, tends to violate more freedom than any other policy. Where do you encounter those libertarians, though? Um, well, like, I've what, where are the pro pro war libertarians? Where are they hiding? Well, I mean, if you if you want to listen to uh, you know Ted Carpenter, who just left uh, Cato, gave like a forty five minute speech on this of how much there is in some of these like you know uh, libertarian uh, you know organizations. Um, I just had a debate with um, the Austin Peterson, who was was a LP candidate for president uh, years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they're out there. Certainly during the um, during the Ukraine war, there were a lot of people um, who call themselves libertarian, who were very quick to say you are, a, you know, a Putin propagandist if, for for bringing up, you know, the fact that us, you know, giving a blank check to this war has done nothing but kill hundreds of thousands of people. So they're, they exist. But there can be wars that libertarians would support. Yes. Would sure. you agree with that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Just yeah. not any in modern. Yeah. Memory. No, like, yeah, I think um, the American Revolutionary War would be a legit. Yes. If you're invaded by an army, you have a right to violently try to get them out. Um, that's but not too many of those. Not too many of those recently. Yeah. I mean, I, th that's where it starts to you put the non-aggression principle at the center of libertarianism. And that's where it starts to get a little murky for me because I think that there would be legitimate wars of self-defense, but how would you square that ever with the non-aggression principle? Because there are always going to be casualties that, you know, um, collateral damage. Well, I mean, if you're, uh, if, if there's an invading army, 
I think that by definition, they are the aggressors. And then, I, yeah, I think it's reasonable. Like if you're saying, am I going to split hairs down to the point that like this other soldier in that, uh, you know, uniform hasn't fired a shot yet. So is he, f I would say, yes, he's fair game. You rolled in with an invading gang. You've, you've, you know, uh, given up your rights. Uh, I mean, the non-aggression principle doesn't mean you cede your right to self-defense, right? Like, but that can sometimes, depending on the specific situation, that can be really difficult to suss out in the mm -hmm. moment. Well, with the Ukraine-Russia war, for instance, the libertarian type people who were siding with Ukraine in that war saw Ukraine as repelling an invader. Uh, I presume your objection to that is more so America's involvement, not necessarily the Ukrainians, right? Oh, no. I mean, I think, to be clear, I think the Ukrainians have a right to self-defense and they have a right to stay and fight um, for their territory, if that's what they wish to do. Um, but that's there's a lot more to that picture than th that's just what's going on. And yeah, like my problem was not just my problem was American involvement and NATO's involvement going way back for for decades. That uh, you know this intentional policy of like trying to to needle the Russians over and over again, and then finally being like surprised when it it resulted in this. Um, but I would say that. You know, there's like, so this is removed from any moral feeling about this. The Ukrainians have a right to defend themselves, but you also like, if someone pulls a gun on you and asks for your wallet, you have a right to fist fight that guy. It's not necessarily a good idea. And so I've, that's more been my thing with Ukraine. It's like, you're fighting a fight you can't possibly win. This was, you know, like, this was blasphemy to say this for the last couple of years, but now everybody's come around to acknowledge that even with the blank check from America over these two years, they just have no shot of winning. So now we're right back to negotiating time. And uh, and yeah, I'd be against, you know, Americans being forced to fund a war, which both armies are being forced to fight because um, these are two conscripted armies after all. So that's um, there's nothing libertarian about that. I think that with one Realm or, where it starts to get complicated here for me is that the when you're talking about what is the role of America's military, and I think that you and I share a sort of libertarian genesis in that we were, I became a libertarian a few years before Ron Paul made his run, but the Ron Paul's 2008 run was certainly energizing for me and what really got me deep into libertarianism and um that you know it it was the first time i'd heard about the concept of blowback and so forth and so it was it was very formative for me as i know it was for you however um there are times when it it seems as if liber some libertarians they almost their analysis is almost which side uh, is America not funding, and that is the side that's who's who who we are going to back. Um, and so, I I, I see um, in in the Ukraine Russia war, um, there is some some of America's self there there is a self interest for America's defense to make it costly to Russia to invade um, and Girl. say, you know, you can't, uh, that, that, you know, so, some level of stability and not, um, you know, escalating things towards, uh, or, you know, not giving a blank check for you to just march troops over borders. Is there not something to that? Like, can it, can self-interest expand beyond simply, only if you are literally, you know, there's bombs on your soil, can you offer any support whatsoever? Well, I mean, so in a way, like if that's the the thinking, which I do think is the thinking in DC, at least for the most for the most part, um, it's like there's a few things to that. Number one, um, so that if if you know putting some type of penalty on Russia for invading is in America's interest, well, let's just be really brutally honest. Well, the cost of that is hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian lives. So, all right, that's if that's a cost you're like comfortable paying, fine. But like maybe take that Ukraine flag out of your Twitter bio because like you're really the most anti-Ukraine person. Um, but then again, these grand plans, like yeah, maybe it would have been in America's uh, best interest if democracy had swept the region in the Middle East, and then they were all like Jeffersonian Republicans or something like that. But that plan doesn't seem to be working out too well. And all that it seems like, I mean, I think that 
um, you know, like the the U.S. dollar is the reserve standard of the world is probably in more jeopardy right now than at any point in my lifetime. This has driven Russia and China to be much closer allies. You've seen um, kind of like a real almost almost a real crack to the unipolar world where it's not even clear that we really are in a unipolar uh, unipolar world anymore. So I would say that look, my perspective from the Russia thing is that. Obviously, Vladimir Putin is he's wrong to invade and it's been the war has been horrific. Um, I do think that not living in libertarian universe, living in the real world and trying to have some type of reasonable modern expectations for what governments are going to do, that the idea that Vladimir Putin said for years, you cannot expand your military alliance to Ukraine. That is off the table. That is my red line. And they knew this. I mean, there's that great uh, memo, if you've never read it, the Nyet means Nyet, where the current CIA director privately writes to Condoleezza Rice and is like, listen, this is for real. This is their red line. You can't, and there is just no way America would tolerate that. I mean, can you imagine if like, if, if Russia was like, we're bringing Mexico into our military alliance, what do you think the reaction from Washington DC would be? You'd be like, absolutely you are not. And we would send troops in there in a second if that was the plan. Then they right in his face kept telling him, well, yes, we are. Yes, we are. We're going to do it. They announced it at the Bucharest uh, summit in, in 2008, just before the war broke out. Uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice. Sorry, that's racist. Uh, Kamala Harris uh, was over there saying, uh, Kamala Harris was over there saying, we're still bringing NATO in. It's still the plan. And so I just think like there is no powerful country that would possibly have reacted different to this. So I don't, you know, that doesn't mean it's good or it's right. But my takeaway from that is like, why would we be so stupid as to keep doing this for no benefit other than like world domination? Yeah, and um, I think that you know, pushing uh, pushing NATO further and further in is certainly uh, an escalating move, and I, I agree with you there. I guess the 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 why the the bigger like philosophical question I, I'm trying to get to is like, so. Looking at, uh, as an example, looking at what just happened in Israel, um, what did the U.S. do? The U.S. sent in our one of our largest aircraft carriers into the Mediterranean to prevent all these other players from getting involved. And I mean, the idea is to stop this from escalating into a regional war. That would seem to me to be in America's self-interest to stop that escalation. And it's a relatively low cost of like, we're just going to park this carrier here. Would that fall within your definition of the conforming to the non-aggression principle? Well, I mean, no, not really. And it's certainly, it's, you know, I'm a complete non-interventionist on all this stuff. So I don't support that. It's not like the most egregious thing the, the American military has ever done. Like I'm kind of, uh, on the scale of things to be outraged by. But look, that's just like, you're looking at one tiny little element of this huge conflict and being like, well, look, this one thing here was done, you know, to that could prevent uh, a wider war. But the whole thing only exists because the US has been propping up this this status quo for, for 60 years. And the fact that we think we're gonna maintain this thing where we go, okay, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna um, prop up Israel, we're going to, you know, make it so that the entire global community, which has been outraged about the treatment of Palestinians for since 1967, um, that we're going to whatever, you know, we'll veto everything at the UN. We'll ignore all of these global human rights organizations. We're going to prop up dictators in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia. And we're gonna, like that. We're going to maintain this whole thing. And then when it blows up, the takeaway to me isn't like, well, you know, we do have to like, you know, sometimes prevent these wars from happening. The truth is that this um none of none of any of this should be America's business. And if we're going to get in the if, you know, if you believe and this is what like Ted Carpenter said in that whole speech about uh the where he was blasting Cato, um that it's like, look, the idea if you're anything that considers yourself a libertarian or it's your 70% of agree with me or whatever, the that doesn't come with being the world empire. You don't have that. There is no such thing as a restrained, uh, a constrained constitutional republic that is also the empire of the world. War is the health of the state. War always grows uh, government for other purposes other than just the war. And people always lose the most of their civil liberty. The, 
The c civil liberties are lost the most during times of war. I want to get back on track a little bit, but I do think that there's, uh, you know, these are themes that we were talking on, touching on in a recent stream where we interviewed Russ Roberts, who I think comes at this issue uh, from a very different perspective than you do. But the thing that I wish more libertarians would grapple with is there is a difference between the aspiration of the role America plays and figuring out from where we currently are, what is the appropriate approach to get to where we want to be? Um, because we, I think we can all recognize that like the U.S. has been funding Israel and supporting Israel for a very, very long time. And I think many people, many good libertarians would say, hey, you know, it's long past time to uh, cut Israel off and allow them to really stand on their own two feet. They have the ability to do that. But realistically, that's not something that we can do right now. Like we can't just fully cut off funding right now and expect there to be no awful ramifications that would stem from that. So the thing that I always struggle with with the vision that you're articulating is, okay, but how do you get from point A to point B? Well, I don't know. I, I think I'd kind of reject the assumption that it would be some type of disaster if we were to cut off uh, aid to Israel right now. I mean, this is kind of the same, like, really? thinking. Yeah. I mean, look, it would put enormous pressure on them to negotiate. That That's really what they'd have to do. Look, Israel is not it, this isn't 1948. Israel isn't in a, a state of war with all the Arab surrounding nations. Which Israel is the precise argument that many people make for why we should have at some point between 1948 and, you know, last year chosen to begin to sort of cut them off from U.S. funding and support, well, right? Like there, but, it, but then there's a certain symbolic, like, if we do that right now, surely that does have ramifications beyond you know, what they would have been had we done that in 2019. Well, I, no, I agree it has ramifications, but I'm just saying that, like, they might be very positive. Um, <laughs> like, uh, there's, look, yeah. Israel has, has been at peace with Egypt since the 1970s. They're at peace with Jordan. They're at peace with uh, Saudi Arabia. All of the, the they they bomb Syria constantly. They've ne Syria's never responded to them. They're just allowed to. It's not even like an issue. Um, Iran might funnel some money to Hamas, maybe some to, uh, I'm sorry, so to Hezbollah and, and some to Hamas. Um, that's, it's not as it, Israel, if they didn't have the backing of the United States of America, would be heavily incentivized to actually deal with the Palestinians, to actually work out a real peace process, not this pretend one, to grant them their independence, stop occupying their areas. Uh, because they, look, a lot of these things, right, like with Zelensky and now with Netanyahu, part of why they're so willing to be so um, provocative is because they know they have the baddest bully in the world that has their back. And if they didn't, they might be like, okay, well, look, we really got to think about this. Maybe we shouldn't just bomb the hell out of Gaza right now because that might actually piss off the world, you know? And so, like, the, we, there's this tremendous moral hazard that we create when we, as the strongest country in the history of the world, are like, we have your back. You know, yeah. and I, I have to say that I I agree with you t t in the to the degree that when I see these images, you know, uh, Israel is having they they're making very tough moral choices right now, and they're making choices that I don't always agree with, and to have us funding uh, or you know being perceived to be joined at the hip with every bomb that they're dropping is is a very bad situation. So. I would like to see us get disentangled. On the other hand, I think that at the moment they have moral, they have s some moral, um, I, basically they have my moral support in terms of pursuing Hamas and doing everything they can that's not a war crime to root out Hamas to the degree that that's possible. So I, I think that to some degree, if the the less entangled that the U.S. got with Israel, the more aggressive we might actually see Israel get in in some in some way, uh, and that's something that we might have to get comfortable with if we seriously want to disentangle with our allies. I don't I I don't think there's reason to believe that Israel's going to really take the gloves off if America stops backing them. I think it would be much more reasonable that they would, you know, uh that they would be more concerned if, coming from a slightly more vulnerable position. Um but you know, look, Israel Israel won a war in 1967 and they've been holding these people ever since. And they just don't have a right to do that. You mean the West Bank? The West Bank and Gaza. Um there's that that's when it's they took 
control of of all of Palestine. Yeah, but it is worth noting also that the situation in Gaza has changed in the last, you know, 16, 17 years. Oh, for sure. But I'm just saying... And the Gaza situation is quite different than the West Bank one. Yes, absolutely. But I'm just saying, like, they won a war in 1967. They have literally not granted these people their independence since then. They then, okay, if you want to talk about what's happened over the last 15 years or so, they then went on a stated intentional... They took on an intentional goal of supporting Hamas specifically so that they could never get their independence, so they could never get their state. And you can read it all, you know, Scott Horton and uh, um, and, and Connor. Every uh, time you mention gr- Scott Horton on the show, we all have to take a drink. You know, okay, like, fine. Well, well, look, I'm just saying they have a great yeah. piece up at antiwar.com and you can just, it's like, read them and weep. These are, the, in their own words, Benjamin Netanyahu and all types of top government level people saying this is our plan and for this reason. We are going to support Hamas because no one will ever g- grant them statehood as long as Hamas is in control. But and Hamas has agency in this too, right? Of like, course, <laughs> of course. But I'm just saying, of, yeah, of course. And not, like, Netanyahu also, like these actions are not like widely supported supported by the Israeli people like this I'm not, fractured yes, the Yes, these are governments. Under, this is yeah. a, Hamas is a criminal gang and Israel a is a government. If you're making a case that the Israeli government errs and fucks up in a million ways, I totally No, I'm just saying like coming that. at it from the point of view of being like, oh, well, listen, I do kind of root for them and they do have the moral right to do this. It's like, yeah, but we're talking about the guys who had an a, 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 a intentional policy of propping up this, this uh, terrorist organization to use them so that they could never grant the Palestinian people, who just like the Israelis are separate from their government, so that they could never grant those people their own independence and autonomy. And then it blew up in their face, and now they're like freaking carpet. Bo- All right, I don't know. People don't like that term, but they are. <laughs> do you have you yeah. looked like the numbers? Like they've dropped more bombs than we did in a year yeah. in Afghanistan yeah. on Gaza over a few weeks. And so no, I don't look at that situation and go like, oh well, they do have like the moral right to root these people out. It's like yes. Like the people who p- did October 7th all deserve to die. Okay, but I'm sorry, when your plan was to prop up a terrorist organization so that the people in Palestine never get their autonomy, and then you just, use that as an excuse to then just start but slaughtering them? it wasn't quite them? propping up a terrorist organization in a, in a vacuum, right? Like there were multiple competing factions of, you know, Palestinian groups that were all going to create a worse situation for Israel. And so to some degree, this was like a strategic choice. To, p- to pick the craziest of them. But, that but was I'm the saying, reason. But it's, not, but it's not like they were picking between like, there's one terrorist group and then there's two democracy loving, you know, groups that will really take care of the people. I'm like, yeah, we're really going to like go for the terrorists and root for them, right? Like it's not. No, the choice was the, I think the it's Palestinian worth authority. I about that, that how was, bad of a choice it was. Oh, okay. But the choice was between say like uh, the PLO, say like uh, Arafat's Arafat types who are literally saying are standing there saying we reject terrorism. We don't want to do that anymore. We want to come to the table. We'll accept 67 borders. We'll accept 22 percent instead of the 44 percent that the U.N. partition plan even recommended, which that was BS because there was no reason they should have taken so little. They're saying we'll take the 22 percent. We want peace. We didn't. Now, I'm not. They said this. I'm not saying they're perfect angels, but to choose between that and Hamas and to choose Hamas over that option, th- th- this isn't like, oh, we have a bunch of bad options, and so we got to pick one. This is like, we have clearly better options, and we will pick the craziest one so that they look crazy to the world. It's frankly the exact same behavior as American voters, right? Like, there's the craziest motherfucker theory of governance. I think that this was like a, was it originally like a Massey proposal? Yes. Yeah. And it's like, sometimes people simply want to vote for the craziest motherfucker in yeah, the room, yeah. and like that to some degree explains a little bit of the Trump phenomenon. I do want to... Um, stifle some of my greatest Zionist shill thoughts and move us back <laughs> in the direction of actually answering sure. what a libertarian is. I mean, because I think we have established that libertarians aren't generally war hawks um, and we are not generally Hamas shills or even Zionists. Uh, Zach, how do you look at this question of what is a libertarian? Defining yourself either in terms totally independent of Dave's or perhaps in response to Dave's. Yeah, the, there's a lot of overlap, unsurprisingly. I see libertarians as extreme skeptics of state power. And the reason for that is that we are against violent monopolies and for voluntary association to the degree that that's possible. And that is because self-ownership. We believe in that idea that uh, self-ownership, self-authorship, you control your own destiny, you write your own story. And, um, you know, the way I like to think of it is this this phrase, right to try. Like, you ha- should have the right to challenge monopolies. And that is 
something liber- I think libertarians across the board recognize that the state is a monopoly on violence and they use that monopoly to create other monopolies. Like we've got Elizabeth Warren and the like out there always talking about monopolies. I think she was just tweeting about a sandwich shop monopoly that she's going to break up. But the real monopolies are created by governments. And um, I think that for various we all have, uh, I think where, where the differ- the differences come in is that we have different reasons for thinking that monopolies are, are bad. But, um, my reason for thinking monopolies are bad is because, um, I believe that the experimentation, um, and competition creates progress and prosperity. So that's my I like that a definition. lot. I yeah. think I agree with both of the things that you guys said. And my definition is perhaps even simpler, this idea that libertarians don't look to the government to fix what ails us. I think libertarians ought to have and generally do have a high degree of comfort with voluntary action existing in civil society outside from government. Libertarians, I think, frequently gravitate toward voice. But also, I love the strain of libertarians that gravitate toward exit, Mm -hmm. trying to exist outside of government institutions. You know, I look at people living off the grid, uh, people choosing to homeschool. There are so many ways that people can just kind of prove out the idea that we actually don't need the government to take care of us in a gazillion ways. We sometimes prosper far, far, far outside of the purview of the state. And in fact, people can be so much freer to live better lives that way. Um, You know, obviously, like the non-aggression principle is you know, pretty core to all of this. Uh, But I think libertarians dispositionally also tend to just be people who take incentives seriously and second order impacts, like unintended consequences. Um, And I really appreciate how libertarians are so frequently asking this question of government policies. Well, what are the alternatives or what are bad incentives that could possibly be created by this? I love how libertarians focus on trade-offs and it drives me absolutely insane that so much of the left and the right seem to you know, never entertain the possibility that a government policy could actually lead to awful unintended consequences. What do you think, Dave? Does any of those, do you jive with any of those or disagreements? I mean, I pretty much agree with what, what you guys are saying. I mean, like I, the, the definition I give, I think is like kind of to the core of the philosophical belief, but I, I agree with everything both of you guys said. And I, I just think that the, to me, the fundal, the fundamental libertarian insight is that um, what the government is, is, as you said, a monopoly on violence. I don't even know if that's the perfect way to say it. It's like, it's cause there are other violent people, right? So there's like, there's criminals too. So it's not like they have, what they have is they have a monopoly on the legal, uh, legal initiation of violence, right? So like they can do it legally, but that I think if you just look at things philosophically, like, cause this is what I, I agree with all the consequentialist stuff too. Like, I think it's, it's pretty obvious. Like you could look at, uh, South Korea and North Korea and be like, okay, what works to create prosperity here? It's not uh, central control. Um, but you mean it's not Potemkin grocery stores, it's, it's all tur- fake fruit. Like yeah. It turns out. Yeah. Um, wow. but, uh, there's, to me, it's like, if you believe in morality at all, which almost everybody does and th- there are some people who just reject it entirely but almost everyone in the political realm like if you listen to bernie sanders he'll say it's it's uh it's immoral that there's this income inequality and you know if you they're listen quite to clear where they're getting it from but yes, they do have some sort they have, of innate they, they said but it, if you right? believe there is such thing as right and wrong then i would say inherently that has to be like morality has to transcend what human beings what organizations we create so like in other words like if you think like if you think uh, murder is wrong, and you you were on a desert island or a, some you know uninhabited land, and there's no government and there's no rules, and someone murdered somebody, that would be just as morally wrong there as it is here. There just doesn't happen to be a legal system or police or whatever. Um, but the morality of it kind of has to be the same. Otherwise, we're not really talking about morality. And so, look, if any other group of people did what the government does, we would know what to call it right away. You would just be like, oh, this is the mafia, or this is a criminal, or this is, you know, like taxation is theft, or you're just forcing someone to give you their money. Um, You know, wars are mass murder campaigns. Like all of this stuff, if you say, if anybody else, any other group of people decided, like, we deem ourselves the regulators, and we're going to go around and start regulating these businesses, you'd be like, oh, no, you're a gang. 
Like you're a criminal organization. And so if you believe in morality, I think it has to be the same whether government does it or not. And that voting doesn't somehow change the moral characteristics of what a group of people do. Right. The only, the issue that I have with being too moralistic about it, though, is that we don't know if the absence of this, you know, legitimate monopoly on violence is a stable situation. Like it's something that is yet to be seen. I'm I'm open to the possibility that uh, everything could be privatized one day or something. But um, I, th you know, it it's got to be. Th th that's why I favor the, this definition where it's a little bit more um, experimental. And you're saying let's try to do not have the state do this thing that the, so we're all was, used to the state doing. Okay, fair enough. And I'm not even like, I don't and, want you know do like a whole anarchy versus minarchy like yeah. thing because I just, <laughs> in today's day and age, it's like seems so right. crazy because we're yes. so far from both. Um, but like, so then what is the, if you're like completely against monopolies and you recognize that monopolies like just lead to these terrible results. So why is it that it's just like, whatever these like five most crucial of things like, why is it just like writing laws and courts and police and military or things like that have to be run by a monopoly? Like, why is it? Because it seems to me like if we're saying that monopolies, especially violent monopolies, are really bad at producing things, then why would it be like they're really bad at producing things in every other field, but the most important things must be run in the worst way to produce things. Otherwise, we'd all be, live in a dystopia. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. All I can say is that it's not that... I, I like I like the theory, but I like the theory to be bolstered by the empirical reality. So I, okay. I like to see it play out and kind of proceed with caution because kind of what the the situation that you see when there's an absence of a state is often it creates a power vacuum and then something worse comes in. And so is that a stable situation? I mean, I'm I'm interested in the experiments that are happening along these lines. Sure. You know, I did a documentary about this place called Prospera in uh, Honduras, where they're trying to privatize all the services. And I think maybe maybe at a very small like micro scale like that, it can work and prove itself out. Um, it's just you know the like you said the practicality of even really discussing it. At a larger level, doesn't doesn't sure. even I lead th anywhere. I think yeah. the answer is a little bit different. I like what you're saying, uh, and you surely will not find this to be satisfactory or something particularly earth shattering. But I do believe in a little bit of the um, sort of unique power of the U.S. Constitution and some of the um, structures outlined in it. That I think you know many a liberal who did their sort of um, Trump hysteria op-ed piece and acted like American democracy was horribly imperiled during the Trump years. Uh, don't place very much faith in our constitution and don't place very much faith in our court systems uh, or in federalism or in the abilities of this very complex system of checks and balances to actually serve as um, something that prevents, you know, the worst excesses of executive overreach. And I think we're libertarians, right? Like there are lots of things that we could sit here and point to and say, well, you know, executive overreach specifically when it comes to war making powers. Okay, that's something we absolutely oppose. And so surely the Constitution has failed us in X, Y, and Z ways. However, with that massive caveat, I do think constitutional limits have done a pretty good job of ensuring some of these state institutions have actually done a decent ish, but imperfect job of serving their intended function. Uh, and I, I look to that as something that like the American system has that many other systems don't and as sort of the best possible argument for um, the more limited government libertarian view versus the ANCAP view. Well, I mean, if you wanna look at how well, and I'm not saying that like there are examples here where like, you know, some unconstitutional policy has been struck down, you know what I mean, or things like that. But if you wanna zoom out and just look at how good the constitution has done at limiting government, I mean, we're the biggest government in the history of the world. And by far, and, and the biggest organization in the history of the world is the US federal government by any metric. 
Um, and so I'm not saying I'm not arguing that this is a compelling argument to you. Yeah, no, but I'm and just like, but like I'm just saying to by, anyone. Like, like, like that you guys were talking about how like it was the Ron Paul era that sort of, you know, radicalized um, you guys and sort of brought you to the libertarian cause. For me, it was the Snowden revelations um, because I'm about a decade younger than you guys um, in case it's not obvious. Yeah, rub it in. Uh, <laughs> fewer children, fewer wrinkles, a decade younger. But no, it was it was the Snowden revelations that really um, were the thing. I was already pretty libertarian adjacent was sort of like, a little bit of oh, I kind of dislike liberal policies, and I'm more into interested in conservative policies. But hey, the drug war is really bad, and then it was the Snowden stuff that really drove home this idea of like, holy shit! Like the government has just been spying on its citizens, and yeah. none of us were really aware of this. And it began to make me pretty radicalized and interested in Fourth Amendment issues, and also pretty passionate about the cause of like we need to ensure that whistleblowers have these first yeah. amendment protections to be able to um you know they'll still frequently get tried for treason or have to flee the country but whistleblowing is a really important public service um and i think that spoke a little bit to this like you know appreciation for dissidents but also an appreciation for what we were able to learn and how we were able to become empowered with more knowledge of how our government was spying on us and lying about it yeah and that that's the, the so i'll concede that like the, well, yeah but the, yeah. the 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 flip side of that the, the fact that we are able to get that knowledge out there is why i chafe a little bit at what the way you're characterizing it dave because um just saying that um you know it's the biggest government in history doesn't really capture the fact that th this is not the most tyrannical government in history no, isn't or the CCP in way modern bigger? Huh? Also, how are you even characterized? Like, how how are you even deciding that? Right? Like, isn't the CCP arguably like way bigger in terms of like bureaucratic function? I mean, and number of employees and. I mean, you got maybe someone could Google it real quick, but I would bet we have more federal employees in, in DC than they have. Do we uh, even but know I, that? That I don't know for sure. But look, in terms of how much money it spends, um, how many bases it has abroad, versus how many? I mean, I think it would be it would dwarf. Uh, that. I now, think I, to more, your point, yeah. North Korea is a much smaller government than us, but yeah, they're much worse to their own people. <laughs> right. However, again. You got to look at this thing in totality. If you're going to judge governments, you know, you don't judge them by how they treat the best of their people. You kind of, you know, like in the same way, if you were judging like a slave master and he had like 20 slaves who he just like w viciously beat every day, but then he had another 10 that lived in the house who he treated pretty good. We don't go like, you know, you're judging him off of the worst of what he does. And so if you're going to judge America, you can't just judge America based on like, hey, it's kind of nice to live in Brooklyn. You know what I mean? Like you got to judge it on, on Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Somalia, mm -hmm. also, Yemen. You know what I mean? Like this is we've we're we have killed millions of innocent people just in the last twenty years. I'm not even going to go back to like Vietnam and all of this. Living so. in Brooklyn isn't nice. I don't know what you're well, talking I, about. It's I grew up there. It was Somalia. nice. It was nice yeah. at that point. So I don't this know. Is, it was really cool in yeah. the 80s and 90s. By the way, <laughs> so this is, era? This is yeah, you know the this is this is foreign policy where we have a lot of agreement, but domestically, um, uh, it's you know living in America is not living under tyranny uh, and by historical it's, standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all like and, variations, yes, and, but I agree with you. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to paint a picture yeah. like, oh, you have a worse life here than you yeah. would living in any one of the, you know, like the, any like Muslim country or living in China or anything like that. I mean, China is probably like, there are probably some people who have very good lives uh, in China, but you don't really want to live like the average person. Uh, does over there. So I'm not denying that, but I'm just saying if you're going to look at uh, the American government, you kind of have to look at it in its totality and judge it by the worst. Like we don't judge the Soviet Union based off what like some guy who was like connected to the government who lived really well, you know what I mean? Like, and there were people like that. But we but, judge them by what they did to the Ukrainians, but right? Because, like, because America has a flawed foreign policy, to say the least, that does not justify throwing out all of the constitutional protections, all the pro-liberty aspects of the US government and saying, we're gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater. That is where I think, you know, we butt heads a little sure. bit with your camp. Name, um, name, a, name another country that has a better system of federalism, a better system of checks on executive power, better speech protections. Like, like name, name the country that is hitting a lot of these categories consistently much more than we are, <laughs> that is operating at scale, my friend. Well, uh, listen, maybe that's I, like, like, uh, maybe the goal should be a example? thousand Lichtensteins, a you thousand? know? That's I what mean, Hoppe I'm, said, I think. But, but no, like, take, it, take it a little more seriously than that, right? Like, Liechtenstein isn't a good enough answer for me. Well, I mean, it, look, there's, there's positive qualities that different 
different countries have. I don't know. If you're going to go to court in any country, which country do you want to be doing that in? If you're, you know, being tried for a crime. It depends what you're being tried for. I mean, it's like it depends on on the situation. You know, I I don't think that um, there's there's probably lots of countries, even more primitively corrupt countries, where you would probably be better off in certain in certain situations. I mean, like, you know, there's there's uh, Eastern European countries where you could just pay a cop off. Uh, when they stop you now that may, we may look down at that like oh that's so corrupt but believe me if you're if you're carrying around like weed in texas or something like that you'd wish you could pay I that mean, cop off i have in fact been in the situation of carrying around weed in texas and getting into some uh sticky uh terrain there but i do think there's this interesting question of like not just like criminal offenses but also like civil court like what about like enforcement of contracts and ensuring that you get a fair shake and the ability to resolve disputes i i i just think it is important to give the U.S. a little bit, I, you know, I hate to well, say this, me, but to give the state a little bit more credit for the things that we are, we have actually very consistently for the last 300 years done pretty well. Let me pick up on the the thousand licked and shines point, because it, that this is essentially the strategy of the Mises caucus that took over the Libertarian Party. Um, and their, their decentralization, project decentralization. We talked to Michael Heiss about it. Um, I want to, we're going to play a clip because Nick interviewed you in Reno during the Mises caucus takeover of the Libertarian Party in May, 2022. And he asked you what you want to see the LP doing in the years leading up to the 2024 election, which we're now rapidly approaching. And this is what you said. I think re-sparking the Ron Paul revolution. I think that's the the task right in front of us. I think if we're ever going to be like, if we're ever going to get to a, to be a more free society, we need to have a lot more people who desire a free society. I don't think there's any path there without that. And the only way to do that is to inspire a lot of enthusiasm and energy, and particularly amongst young people. Because I think if we're playing the long game here, that's what matters the most. And the only way to do that is to actually stand for something and really introduce people to a radical new way of thinking about things. You know, you don't do that by running Bill Weld and saying, hey, this is the most boring, moderate establishment guy we could find to call himself a libertarian. That's never going to be a game changer. And that's what we need here is a game changer. Uh, so do you think that the new Libertarian Party is poised to deliver a game changer? Well, I, uh, I hope so. Um, you know, look, it's with all these things like that's what I try to do. Right. Like I'm always like trying to do that. Um, I think that it was I think the Mises caucus taking over the Libertarian Party was necessary for there to be a chance for the Libertarian Party to do that. We're still, we're fighting a very uphill battle. Like anybody who believes in liberty is fighting an uphill battle, um, but- Perhaps more uphill now that the Mises caucus is in power. Well, I, I would completely disagree. I mean, I think that, look, it doesn't matter. I mean, like, you know, you could say that um, there's like big donors have walked away from the Libertarian Party since they came in, which like several of them have. And that one um, in four members have also walked away. Well, okay, yeah, but look, I mean, the truth is that there was basically a civil war within the Libertarian Party, and no matter what happened in Reno, believe me, if we if we had lost in Reno, we represented like eighty percent of the party. I mean, like tons of people would have walked away from the party. You know what I mean? So that's the the truth is that say when lockdowns came, the old Libertarian Party basically rolled over and took it and didn't want to say anything. And in fact, the only comments they would make would be like, well, we do think you should stay home. You know, hashtag like we wear do, a mask, yeah, right? hashtag like that wear was a mask, a social distance yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So you, the, basically that we already, it already deserved. So if they're not even going to try to stand up for liberty, then I don't care if some big donors will support oh. you and are alienated well, by us. Let, like, I, and, and, and again, also the Joe Jorgensen campaign. I mean, there's like a total like embarrassment that she didn't, she was, Joe Jorgensen would go to uh, give speeches where a crowd full of people in masks were forced to be socially distanced in a park where a father had been arrested a week earlier for having a catch with his son and talk about, um, the drug war or how socialism is bad or something like that. And not even like, not even want to touch the moment that she was living in. So in terms of like, can the Libertarian Party spark like the next Ron Paul movement? Well, no, not if it's doing that. It has no chance. But surely you believe in like, like surely you are 
you relate to the place that I'm in, where I sort of, you know, have consistently l- looked at the political duopoly and I'm like, nope, I don't have to vote for team blue and I don't have to vote for fucking team red either. And now I look a little bit at the former Libertarian Party and now the Libertarian Party as taken over by the Mises Caucus. And I'm a little bit like, no, I don't have to vote for the hashtag wear a mask Joe Jorgensen crew. I don't have to support them. But I also don't have to support the... um what was it? It was like the Uyghur genocide is fake and Ukraine is gay. Hashtag fake and gay. Like, yeah, I don't well, know that, whether that was LP or LP and H. So, but like, surely, like, surely. That's a, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I don't mean I'm to not, cherry pick, but I do think that that is somewhat representative of like the edgelordery, memeing, trolling of the LP and the fact that they're trying uh, what they perceive to be an edgier messaging strategy that I think, frankly, just moves a lot of people further away. And so well, I'm looking at these two options and I'm a little bit dissatisfied by both because I'm like, where's the actual representation of people like us who I think are pretty reasonable I think p- pretty pissed off about the covid regime pretty interested I think a lot of us I think we share a lot of similar values and I think we want to see libertarian ideas win the day and be successful and I'm not looking when I look at <laughs> Angela McArdle and Michael Heiss and the Mises caucus takeover and Jeremy Kaufman I don't really see champions for the things that I value well all right so first of all I I will say that like I hate the Twitter edge lording and shit posting and that stuff. I just hate it. I hate all of it. And I've I've that's, been on record. Tell, uh, I've been on record as this for years. But as far as and I, I can wish tell, people that's their would entire strategy. Right? Well, like, it that's does. Like well, that, OK, but you're separate. No, like, there's one state affiliate in New Hampshire where that is their that is their entire thing. And they've been totally like basically at, at war with the Mises yeah, caucus. Like, that, sense, you know what yeah. I mean? Like total. And so it's not as if like that's look, I would say that LP I don't like this. There are also, by the way, there also are. Uh, it's much, much better. It much, is, much it's better. better. Um, but there's also been like on the other side, like non Mises controlled, you know, state affiliates that do like a ton of this, like kind of just engagement farming kind of shock value stuff. And I just don't like it. I just don't like any of that. Like to me, like what I always said was like what got people excited about libertarianism to me was Ron Paul giving his history lessons like this stuff is just lame but i will say that because i don't know where you are and that you know like the um the as far as the Uyghur genocide thing goes the state department put out under donald trump right they put out in, in his like last year that just this announcement that there's a genocide going on in china they the only source that they quoted was that uh zen's guy whose numbers were completely wrong and so i i would certainly be like skeptical of like uh, listen i'm not get if you're telling me a government's genociding some people like i'm listening i hate governments they do terrible things you i mean to say not... that the chinese communist party is doing sure. something no bad? well there's no question they're doing something bad and they're a, a you know a brutal authoritarian i think more fascistic really than communist government um but the, I mean, those Chinese those Zen numbers, and I believe he even admitted them. This it wasn't even like a oh you have this interpretation, and you have these. Like he didn't carry the four when he was supposed to, but, and made it out like they're doing something that they're not. The way, but but I think there's a ton of space for people like all of us, scrupulous um, truth seekers, to look at the information that we currently have. Some of which is absolutely unreliable, right? Uh, because it is very hard to figure out what goes on within the CCP controlled borders. I think it's very fair to look at these reports and try to suss out what is true, what is false, which numbers are inflated, which reports we ought to believe. ProPublica had a really good investigation of some of the surveillance regime um, that's used to control the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. I think it's very fair to like have those types of conversations. The way to do that um, is not to just be outright denialist and then to hashtag fake and gay, right? Like this is yeah, just but okay, obviously but I'm not, like but I'm a not, deeply- Like I said, I don't, the, the fake and gay thing, like I just, I hate all it's that just, stuff. It's just, it's so stupid. So, I, well, I also, look, they'll say their argument is like, well, look, this blows up. This is the way to get a ton of attention on Twitter. And then they'll see our other tweet that's like defend the guard and like doing all this serious stuff. My thing is always like, my calculation is like, I think you turn off way more people than that, than that benefit is. But I've made that very clear privately to to those guys for years i've done it publicly to them so look i'm not saying like none of this is none of this is perfect and i wish uh i wish all libertarians would just shut up and do exactly what i tell them to do but it turns out that's not how libertarians are uh, wired so it doesn't (laughs) it doesn't work well so i mean in, in one sense it sounds like what you're saying is you know there was this awful messaging that existed before, this very out of touch messaging during just one of the most insane years in modern history. And so this new leadership came in, they came in pretty hot, they've dialed it back a little bit. 
I looked into some of the numbers coming into this. Some of these were compiled by their the Mises caucus's enemies, the classical liberal caucus, which but what they compiled here is that revenues are down historically when you adjust for inflation and not only big donors but monthly donors are down and I looked into the actual reports behind the numbers and it's all accurate except the LP did not adjust for inflation which seems like something you should do. Well what do you mean raise prices? <laughs> like um the raise the membership the, the, cost? The, they're showing rev like in the LP reports the revenue looks kind of like slightly up because inflation um but if you adjust for inflation yeah, revenue yeah, is at historic lows yeah but so what's the your takeaway from that my takeaway is that revenues are down monthly yeah but i mean that's like you know that's like if you have a job where you're making a hundred grand a year and then you just keep your job and someone's looking at that and go like uh dude your your income is way down from there i mean yes that's true but that's i, I mean if you're blaming the federal reserve then i'm with you but if you're blaming the mises caucus no for no, that, no i'm, I'm, I'm right. saying the federal reserve and the mises caucus. okay we're, we're i'm we're saying technically i mean usually when organizations measure their historic revenues they would adjust for inflation that's not true uh, if like coca-cola puts out like earnings statements they're not going to adjust okay. for inflation okay but coca-cola well, isn't going like well, let me, they'd be like no we took in three bit we had three billion this year 3.2 okay billion well this we'll, year, we'll three... leave it for the audience sure. to judge whether that is a good or bad number sure. but uh what do you think is going on here internally well i mean just to to be clear like i'm not you know, I have no position in the Libertarian Party. And like, if you talk to like Angela or someone like that, I'm sure she could give you a much better answer than this. I'm not like on the LNC. I just I'm, I just do stand up comedy and podcasts about this stuff. But from what I, I understand about it, there was they did have this major problem with like this software thing. Um, I, I don't exactly know the details of it. This is something that started before the Mises caucus took over and all through them where it's a, a big basic disaster of transferring data. So I think that hurt him a little bit. But regardless of any of that, um, it's like this. I think that the the state of the Libertarian Party was no matter what happened at Reno, going to it was going to be a rebuilding, you know, like a couple of years in this sense. That there's a lot of people who were very turned off by uh the Mises caucus in the Libertarian Party, and there were a lot more people who were, you know what I mean, willing to go to to fight for them, and that's why we won. Um in terms of the the stuff with donors uh, walking away, again, like I said, it's just to me if the if the calculation is going to be that well, like like let me say it like this, right? There are kind of these storms that come in where things are very sensitive to talk about. Like right now, it's the Israel Palestine storm that we're living in, where it's like kind of takes a little bit of courage to talk about these things because you know you're going to get this backlash. The storms end. And then it's like, no one cares. Like I, lab leak theory. Any of us worried, worried about talking about that now? You worried about your YouTube channel getting, no, it's fine. You can totally talk about it. That was, we were in a storm a couple of years ago where you couldn't talk about that. Ukraine is like that, right? And for me, libertarians are, when we have value at the most is when in those storms, we're willing to stand up and say the courageous thing. This is why Harry Brown writing, uh, uh, when will we learn on September 12th is like the most amazing thing ever because the day after 9-11 he had the courage to say that the the only way this libertarian party thing is ever going to work and grow is if in those storms we have the courage to say things now but, I'd agree with you but that's that, what I'm, but I, that I'm could come there. without some of this other well, stuff that's not there. helpful I want to stop there though but that's not what the Mises caucus is doing I would say I would argue they are how I mean, that I'm talking about every single one of these uh, conflicts. So like the, the Ukraine storm, when that came, they were the first ones standing up opposing that policy. Right now in Israel, doing the exact same thing. So like that's the type of thing that I do think the Mises caucus has that but they bring to the table. Is there a use in that if nobody takes them seriously anymore, right? Like, like well, and I don't if think that's true that nobody takes them seriously anymore. Do you think people anymore. still take them seriously? Yeah, I don't. I went from being like, yeah, maybe I'll vote for the LP presidential candidate to now it's like I would sooner vote for anybody else available on my ticket than these people. But because why is that? So what, if the, what is their crime that's worse than I, Joe I, Biden and Donald Trump? I mean, I'm just I'm stunned by the shift toward I don't I don't believe if you actually, I think, put any of these people in power. I'm not sure they would know the first thing about what to do with it or how to actually craft any sort of policy. I mean, you have text exchanges from Angela McArdle and Michael Heiss talking about how 
uh, personally bankrupt they are and how much money they've lost in the process of doing this. I'm sorry, but if you can't run an extremely small, just speaking candidly here, political party and you're not able to, you know, keep your supporters in any way, what why would anybody trust your competence overall? Like, I'm just very who are I mean, who are who's even running for president this year? Right. Like, they, like if, if the I but, but if the idea is, you know, you are a political party and you are putting candidates up for, you know, election for political office. Surely they should be people. Well, the with some elephant in the room is that and... da Dave was going to run for president. Uh, yeah. and you didn't run for president. And now they're kind of flailing. I, is that kind of a many I mean I think you're I think you're kind of overplaying this kind of like no one takes them seriously and it's I mean, it's they, like they have there's... the text messages there were those text messages yeah and I mean I don't want to comment where personally... I don't want to comment on private text messages that people like no, put and, out and, there I, and, I also just think that's lame and wrong I, no, and, and it's also why, like it's Steve, not you'll know that you could, that's look, also I, why I bet I could find if I found private text messages right like let's say I just had access to all of your texts with your wife and your texts with your husband I bet I could cherry pick them and, and put them out there and be like look their marriage is failing look at this one exchange that I found here about we're out of money yeah okay well fair enough um <laughs> but uh but i'm just saying like you so i don't know like you're telling me you got one exchange but these weren't, these weren't well, messages between say. spouses right and and i also no, i don't no, know but like they're messages note... between co-workers still they're messaging between I, I mean i don't know even technically what you would call them but the fact that in a moment they're like complaining about something i'm not gonna like draw too much of a conclusion from that i do think like yeah, like there's been the membership and 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 money is down. The Libertarian Party historically has had lots of different periods before where membership and, and revenue have been down. In fact, they've had points where revenue was very down, but membership was very high. They've had points where the vote totals were the highest, but the the membership was very low. There's been the truth is that the Libertarian all Party, over the map in a bunch of different yes, ways. Yeah, but I also agree. for the entire history, they've largely not been successful. That's the truth. We took this thing over a couple years ago, and it's a huge restructuring. Uh, um, you know that's been going on now in terms of like me not running yeah look i mean there, there's definitely something to that like i was considering that that was kind of like a rallying point for a lot of our guys and i decided not to do it um and so there's been some disappointment about that but i do think that like i'm i'm hopeful that over the next year and over the next couple of years this is going to like because i almost think of the mises caucus as like it was like this cleansing thing where we had to like return to like radical principles that are what the party was started on to begin with and then kind of like now out of that has to grow like candidates because that's really what rallies yeah. people well, so that I, are radical so pr principled candidates. I want to take this seriously because I agree with you, right? Like there was a reason why I didn't choose to like tweet and take a little gleeful victory lap about the, you know, text message and email revelations about all the trouble that LP was in, right? Like I agree with you that it's important not to draw overly broad conclusions about that. But say you wanted to take your argument seriously and you wanted to look for these small green shoots that are poking up through the dirt as to the ways in which the Mises caucus takeover has been successful. Where would you tell us to look? Well, like, oh, what, what should we look to as evidence of, you know, actually, it's pretty good. Well, actually, I mean, look, it's uh, there, there have been like actual what the Libertarian Party always kind of has only is that there have been local elections that they've won. And that stuff does matter. I mean, there are, you know, there are people where we've gotten like on school boards and on city councils and uh, mayors, I think a couple sheriffs, you know what I mean, throughout the country. Again, I'm not like Heiss is a better guy to talk to about all of this stuff to like rattle off all the names. They have launched this, uh, the Mises Caucus has launched this Project Decentralized Revolution thing, which I think is a really great um, like template for how the Libertarian Party should run. And it's very different than the way it's been used before, where kind of like the strategy for the Libertarian Party would be like, um, you know, you show up to like your state affiliate and they're like, what can I do? And they're like, I don't run for something. And whereas this is now targeting like winnable elections with nullification powers. So that's kind of like the idea is building this thing where the national is kind of like messaging and then trying to funnel that into like the local which winnable the elections with nullification powers. strategy of like the Sunrise Movement, I believe, which is like the organization that initially put a bunch of money behind Ale Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Okay. Right? Like, yeah, like yeah. there's, you know, a specific, there's like a big infrastructure. Yeah, but they're on going the even more left. local than that, yeah, which is exactly. like, it's I mean, smarter. Heiss was saying sheriffs are a big one because <laughs> they've got a lot of power and, um, or like a city council member or something like that. Things yeah, that well, are the idea is people, uh, positions where you can nullify federal uh, um, laws or federal mandates. Right. That's and kind of there's what you relatively target. low voter turnout. Yes. So you actually and have so a chance of winning. Right. Yeah, so, so that's, that's kind of yeah, the, the plan strategy, and yeah. then the the thing is that 
you know, again, like I said, the other thing to me is just that it is like, look, there, I'll, I'll take responsibility in some way that a lot of my guys on Twitter are like, can, you know, can fly off the handle and say some, some wild shit. But the one thing I will say about my guys is they don't compromise on the libertarian stuff. And they're not going to be afraid to like, you know, say the thing that will get you a lot of backlash when it really matters. Now, I wish I'm like I said before, I'm not for a lot of the edge lording stuff. I don't like that. That's not how I run my Twitter. I mean, I'll insult people sometimes if they insult me first or stuff, but I'm not like the non aggression principle applied. To yes, insults. kind of right. My yeah. version You're of that. Like if provoked, well, I, can, I suppose I, I can be a little bit vicious on there sometimes. So I'm not like saying I'm perfect Have you or ever, anything in fact, like been that. Vicious to anybody in this room about was say, I vicious to you? Uh, RFK Jr. <laughs> No, just well, kidding. I, I think I think I don't was, think I was that. You know, what, honestly, you. I don't think you were either. Um, it was Michael Malice who was vicious. Um, oh yeah, well, Michael Malice is a, a furious woman. You got to be careful <laughs> about him on Twitter. No, I mean it's all in good fun. I, I'm also the type of person where I can just take it. Like I don't care. Twitter much, also kind of does I that think. to all of us. Yeah, oh, you know, completely. like it just it is it this thing that it's that, yeah, it's right? just and it's hard not to like get sucked think, into that. I think, but they, I don't think I don't think like but I don't think that I don't think I've gained like a following in the libertarian side of things because of any of that. I think like people like, like like me because I'm good at explaining this stuff. And like, to me, that's always, that's the way people are converted to, you know, like people will bring up like that one time Ron Paul was on uh, uh, Morton Downey Jr. And he kind of snapped at those people, but that's never anyone's origin story. No one ever goes, I'm a libertarian because I saw Ron Paul on Morton Downey Jr. They go, I saw him explain history to uh, Rudy Giuliani. Dave, I think you're un possibly unintentionally making my precise argument. I am so in favor of being bold and aggressive and courageous and truth telling and saying that unpopular thing at an important time. I mean, I felt very riled up in the COVID days. Um, and it sometimes felt like I was maybe not at reason, but like, you know, one of the only people in my sort of social circles, very comfortable sticking my neck out and being like, no, fuck no, you shouldn't be forcing me to show my vaccination status at the door to enter a New York City restaurant. No, how dare you? And to the extent that you are going to force that, everybody should forge them. I'm sorry, but like the Liswell forging services are open. I'll do it for the low, low price of zero dollars, right? Like we need to be doing mass civil disobedience because this type of thing is just profoundly authoritarian. So like I am in favor of all of that. I am in favor of that sort of boldness, but I don't see that in what the LP post takeover is doing. Well, and that's the thing that gives me pause. I mean, it's interesting, your metaphor of it being a clean, sort of cleansing fire or something that, that that's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, that's a way to think about Trump as well, even if you're regardless of how you feel about Trump, it kind of cleared out the deadwood in the Republican Party. And, you know, I don't think any of us are uh, saying that the Libertarian Party that existed before was exactly uh, tearing it up or killing it. I, I, I am I'm interested well, in. Can I just yeah. can I just say, though, because I think like to some degree, it, it's kind of like I think you might be a little bit guilty of the same thing that I think like the New Hampshire guys are guilty of in being like, no, this is the, the strategy because this is how you get a big fuck. Because the truth is that there are 50 state affiliates, okay? And a whole bunch of them are just doing exactly what you're saying you'd like to see done. But you're totally fixated on the one because they're saying this wild shit, even though everybody else, everybody at the top of the Mises caucus, like leadership, has totally called them out for it and been like, hey, we think this is stupid and unhelpful. So I'm but just I'm saying just, that like, there's a ton about, of those guys. There's a ton of those state party affiliates. The, but I'm not just talking about the LP New Hampshire people. I'm not just talking about the you know authors of the tweets uh, at like Megan McCain mourning her father's funeral, like cry more pork chop. I think that was an LP and H tweet, not an LP national one. You know, that 100% was not an LP national tweet. But, but, yeah. I, I, but I would say that like, you know, the... LP National has, I, I see tons of, you would think that the lone political party that deigns to represent, you know, me and Zach, that when I would see these tweets in my feed from the LP National uh, organization, when I see these tweets in my feed, you would think that I would be like, oh yeah, I maybe roughly agree with that. Maybe it's a little tonally different than what I would go for, but you know, roughly right idea. In fact, that is not the case. I think I had followed them because I'm like, this just makes me, you know, actively feel ill. Well, what did they, the, I mean, I, can't. I, I, I mean, we can, we can, you know, go through and spend all day doing this, but I think that there's a certain amount of, I don't want to overly fix it on the tweets, right? Because social media presence isn't, you know, it's not like anybody really cares about Twitter, you know, was bleeding, hemorrhaging users for a while there. It seems like it's had a little bit of a resurgence. It's not just that. I think I'm also looking at the, you know, lack of clarity regarding 
you know, who they're running for president. Um, you know, I'm interested in these local elections, but I want to see better data as to almost like full on A-B testing, you know, how many people were winning office in those types of elections before the takeover versus now, sure. because that would be like the pro proper methodology to use. Well, and then it's I'm not, also, but it's I am a little concerned. more complicated it, than it that is, because you got to figure out like which spot, because yeah. like, you know, if you've got 50 dog catchers, that's yeah. not as good as one yeah. sheriff. You it, know what I mean? Well, so it's kind of like And also like to, some races are winnable at a certain time. And so right, a race right. might not have been winnable it's hard, Yeah, it's hard to parse and, all that yeah. out. Yeah. Well, let me pull but, it back from the party for a second, because sure. I think we spent a, a good chunk of time there talking about the Libertarian Party. But for libertarians, what do you think libertarians should be doing differently to win and interpret that as broadly as you want to. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I've, like I've said this for a long time, but I think that, uh, that is, this isn't me, this is Murray Rothbard. Uh, so I'm not trying to like take credit for coming <laughs> up with this. Um, but that, cause there was kind of like the battle between the Hayekian approach yeah. and the Rothbardian approach. Well, I'll fess where, up that my definition of libertarianism was straight off, uh, ripped off from Hayek. So okay. uh, against monopolies. Well, the, in you fact, guys was are it going you, to do a, did a you, you might've messaged soon. me about this. Uh, once where I was talking about the the split between the like win over the intellectuals uh -huh. versus like versus like the populist I think so. uh, message. Yes. So I'm a big believer in the Rothbardian kind of like populist idea that and look, I think you see this with uh, Javier Malay, right? Like this is the way it can be done. Like this is the way to do it is to tap into these, this this kind of populist streak, particularly at a time when the elites have so mismanaged everything and kind of like talk to people about how they are being ripped off. How, like how they're being ripped off and these guys are doing it to you. And then the, the problem with populism always is that it's completely devout of any type of theory. You know what I mean? Like that's basically the issue with the, the new right in general is like, there's just no theory there. It's just everything they're against. And so- You mean like what, the Holly Vance contingent, like those types or- Yeah, I don't know enough about right? him okay. personally, but I'm just saying like a just Trumpian movement in general. There's just no, it's it's always like, he's railing against everything that is pretty horrible. And then he, it's like, so what's your thing? And it's like, good deals. Make the best deals. Only me. Only I can. Do. It's like there's nothing really there. But libertarians already have that. It's like libertarians have all the theory, but we're missing all of the like populism to make it like appeal to to people. But Malay so. has almost pulled the greatest trick because you're describing him as somebody who really grokks this sort of populist um, messaging, and and really manages to you know use that to win an election. But he also, I think, represents a little bit of an intellectual streak too, right? Like he yeah, has, he, he has both. Yeah, no, that's, like, my, that's yourself, what I'm saying. You yeah, should I have mean, both. He's yes. a hybrid. And, yes, he he is an Austrian economist. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like he know, he's, like, he's but an he's, Austrian he economist. He has talks. the Rothbardian populism and sort of, you know, a bomb throwing aspect to him. Chainsaw wielding. But I've also seen like old TED talks of him where he's doing, you know, like our world and data chart showing, you know, the the prosperity that capitalism brings. Things. Right. Like he is uh, a very interesting model, I think, for libertarians to look at. I don't know how much of it translates to America or no, not. No, but what I mean, do you I think? do think, look, I yeah. think that if I were to say in terms of like candidates, like if that's what we're talking about, um, whether in the LP or not, but like. Ron Paul really is who our blueprint should be. I mean, and Ron Paul had a lot of things going against him. Like, I don't, he's the greatest living hero in America to me, as far as I'm concerned. I'm just saying that, like, you know, he wasn't like the best public speaker. He wasn't like the most, like, charming guy he was older when he really got very popular but he just did he had a way of connecting you know like it's like our our like ideas on knowing what's going on in the world right now and then connecting it to the average person of like how this is screwing you over like and how this is like this is the story of what happened here so that to me is always like my blueprint you know there's different can't, if, if you the question was just like my advice to libertarians on how to do libertarianing um like i my thing is always that it's like you have to actually know what's happening in the world and not just like live in your theory I think libertarians are way too removed just in theory and that's not what anyone except us cares about like and that's so you have you know it's like that was the to me that was the most impressive thing about ron paul was that this guy was like a he was a country doctor who knew, just knew more, and didn't, not just knew the non-aggression principle, or not just knew, like, I've read Hayek and Rothbard, but knew, like, okay, you know, if you just sit Ron Paul down, and you're just like, okay, so tell me the entire history of, you know, like, what happened, uh, the entire history of, like, monetary policy, and you know, he could just talk to you for three hours about it, because he just knows everything, and, like, that's, I think, what 
much more, you know, it's like when I use my, my father-in-law is always like the gold standard to me of Joe six pack. Cause he's just like, he's like a truck driver, just been a truck driver his whole life. And he's just like working class guy, very smart guy, but not like, you know, not highfalutin smart, like, you know, like regular guy smart. And if I start talking to him about the non-aggression principle, He's gonna look at me like, what are you talking about? Like, who cares about this abstract theory in your mind? But if I start talking to him about how prices are so high, like he's very, he's, he's listening. And then I'm like, okay, well this is what happened. And this is why prices are so high. And then he's totally with me on that. So I think that's what libertarians gotta do is like uh, attach our theory to the problems that real people face and demonstrate how we have solutions to them. That's what works. This is, I think, why the, um obnoxious chorus of like beltwayterian bugs me so much i think this is so frequently thrown at reason but then also i feel like i get a lot of like weird personal insults about this um you know to 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 on twitter and it's always odd to me this idea of like what image of you know me or zach or reason have people concocted in their minds to possibly think that we're you know beltway lobbyist shills in dc like like or or you know overly policy wonky and obsessed with these things i'm sorry but like i spend most of my time i live in queens i moved away from brooklyn because i figured you know i've used voice plenty time to do some exit and it's time for a little bit of a, a you know child raising stage queens pivot because i'm a little sick of the brooklyn hipsters and now i spend so much time around like like surfer bros who are the dumbest people you could possibly find but the degree to which they're so angry about like covid policy and covid hysteria because it so frequently like forced them out of the water and for any like outdoor athletes this was i mean this is the thing that gives them life uh and the fact that the government could possibly crack down on a solitary sport where you're outdoors you know separated from other people it's just like an astonishing they're not libertarians because of highfalutin policy ideas they're not libertarians because they read a cato white paper they're libertarians because they saw firsthand the degree to which government was going to great lengths during this very difficult time to screw them over and force them to step away from the thing that they love doing that was healthy for them yeah. uh and you see this in you know surfer communities in queens and in costa rica and you know i encountered some of these dudes in like portugal and like that's the strain that's a that's a genre of person that i'm so fascinated by and so excited about and i hope the malays of the world can tap into people like that but it's just like no they're irreverent they're independent and a lot of the times they haven't even thought about how you know government is stepping on their necks until it actually you know becomes too impossible to avoid and i don't think that they would ever put themselves into you know, the category of libertarian, but I think that there is a deep libertarian essence that gets tapped into when you face any sort of like authoritarianism from sure, your yeah. government. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting dynamic, but in terms of like the stuff you were saying about like, you know, the people, the, the libertarians on Twitter who like drag reason and it's, stuff like that, it's, um, it's a nonspecific complaint and I wish they would actually communicate well, what it is they're I think you guys by, I think you guys do for whatever reason I think you inherit a lot of the Cato hate um because yeah. you know what I mean like I think, <laughs> it's like, I think I'm not Cato, sure they know yeah. Cato deserves it a lot more than <laughs> than reason does but, send your complaints but, to Cato <laughs> well I mean look Cato totally like humiliated them, themselves during COVID and the fact that they allowed some of that stuff to be run under their name it's like dude there's just there's kind of no coming back from that like you can't just you live in the, under a moment that is the biggest mass suspension of all basic rights of a domestic population perhaps in our history and you're gonna sit there and put out pieces that are like the libertarian case for why this is all all right and i mean so like so i think they deserve it you're talking but, about like the articles in favor of vaccine mandates yeah in okay. favor of vaccine mandates right. and all uh, stuff like that um and uh and then and even some pieces that were like you know under some libertarian theory can we justify lockdowns because would you know it be an act of aggression if you know just these mental gymnastics to pretend that like what we all see is going on here is not going on here and then they were also wrong about everything like on top of on top of being wrong to try to justify this, they were just wrong on the information. Like they would be saying, like uh, uh, in the piece where they did the libertarian case for vaccine mandates, they say in the piece that it's become clear scientifically that the vaccine uh, um, that the vaccine gives you better immunity than natural immunity, which was like never. None of the science was ever even pointing to that. Like it's just it's just on top of just wrong on every level. But I think that like if you just the way you talk about COVID. Okay, if that was all anybody uh, saw of you, 
I can guarantee you, you wouldn't be getting pushback from those people. And I think the core of it is that- Dave, was that a compliment in there somewhere? Yeah, you're great on COVID. <laughs> yes, there's t it's totally no, but a COVID. I, I think... But I think what you get pushback on, at least from what I've seen, is the stuff that it comes down to that Murray Rothbard piece, that it's, do you hate the state? And yeah, and that when you, what people don't like, and I think a lot of them, um, what gets a lot of them worked up is that it's like, when you see the f libertarians kind of being like uh, taking this line that it's like, you know, well, they're just they're a bunch of jokers who are really inefficient at how they govern us. And they've got these, you know, they don't understand these unintended consequences and these buffoons can't get it right. Whereas like this other crowd of libertarians are like, they're no, moral, these people are actors, monsters. You know? These people are monsters who are destroying people's lives and they're enriching their friends to do it. And they know what they're doing and they're doing it anyway. And there's this kind of like reaction against the people who take more of the the unintended jokers. Type, I honestly type think deal. that both sides do, in the extremes, do a bad analysis on, on this, on on looking at the motivations of why government actors are doing what they're doing. I think that saying that they're all a bunch of goofballs, uh, which isn't it, my argument. Though. Yeah, is that that's not the right way. Uh, but also saying that people in government are particularly nefarious or evil. Um, I mean, I, I subscribe to just basic public choice theory where they're driven by the same incentives Solitary, that yeah. the rest of us are. It's just, it's self-interest and self-image. And it's, you know, Fauci has bad incentives. Well, That's why he does what he yeah, does. I mean, it's not because well, he's an evil person. I think, I think so it's frequently, so I think that. it's, well, Fauci is it. Well, we can talk about Fauci. I, I do think that, is, you know, is that what Zach is tapping into is true to how I look at it too. I think it's frequently a, a mixture of malice and incompetence. And I think sometimes it's, it's sometimes a very case by case thing where sometimes it's more incompetence. Other times it's more malice. I would say with Fauci, I would probably, uh, you know, say that that airs more toward the side of malice. But I think that either explanation as almost this, ref it's like a reflexive tick where it's like, oh, well, state actors are always malice and it's always, you know, it's it's their evilness showing or the other reflexive tick of, well, they're never really corrupt, um, you know, or evil because they're always just dumb, incompetent buffoons. Like that shows that you're not actually looking at the facts of the case before you. And to me, that indicates, um, you know, a very dogmatic way of looking at the world that will lead you to bad conclusions. So well, I see it as frequently a mixture of the so two. So I certainly wouldn't say that there it's like a 100% evil and that there is no just kind of like buffoons there. I mean, obviously there are tons of buffoons in government, but to your point about like, hey, look, it's the same incentives that drive all of us. Like there, there there's some truth to that, but that's almost like if there's like, you know, uh, some young man out there who's like, he's incentivized to want to get laid. So he like, tries to charm a girl and take her out on a date. And then there's another 25 year old who rapes a girl because you know what I mean? Like they may have had the same incentives to some degree, but those are not like the same type of people or that. Listen, look, you can look at a lot of these examples, but if you, by the way, if you ever heard uh, Hillary Clinton on tape laughing about getting a child rapist off when she knew he was guilty, like laughing about it. Like she just thinks it's hilarious. Are you on like, the Clinton kill list? Do you think? Uh, I, I've done everything I can. Uh, to get You're there, trying. I don't. I don't think I'm close enough to him. But, uh, but like the, like these people and a lot of these people at the top level of government are horrifically evil people who will knowingly, you know, like uh, put in place a policy where innocent people will die. They'll lie through their teeth to to sell the policy. Their buddies will all get rich off of it. I mean, like I don't think it's like. Oh, those are just like kind of the same type of people as as a guy who runs a bakery. Like they want more power and he wants more power, you know? Like, yeah, they may all want things, but what some of these people are willing to do to get it is like so like crazy vicious. And I do think that at the at the top levels of our government, there it is permeated with violent sociopaths who are very comfortable doing very evil things. And look, I mean, even just like uh, you look at the um like when you step back and see some of this, and this is true in media too. Like, you know where there's like a, was that that woman from uh, ABC who was caught on the hot mic talking about how she broke the uh, Jeffrey yeah. Epstein story, but they, name, they pulled but yeah, it from her, I remember right? That, yeah. But one of the crazy things about that hot mic is that what she's upset about, if you listen to her, is not 
what you think any normal person should be upset about. It's like, the lack of clout. It's that she didn't yeah. get the story. Right. She's yeah. like, and I had well, that's it. Just, that's just I journal- had the story. That's just and that's- journalist brain, right? Like that's a huge problem. The entire, not maybe not the entire media class, but a significant, a hefty portion of the media class is obsessed with their own bloated and frequently wrong sense of moral superiority, yes. as well as this just astonishing self-importance that but, God made them journalists and they're God's gift to man. And it, it but think about how evil that so, is. It's, that, that, how evil it is that she horrible. didn't quit. Yeah. You didn't quit and go break this story anyway? Mm-hmm. You just stayed yeah. there, what, because the paycheck's good? So you're telling me you had a story about a child rapist ring with the most powerful people in the country implicated in this story, and your bosses for, went, now nah, we're not gonna, it'll mess up our relationship with the royal family that's what she says in the hot mic and her response to that wasn't to quit and just tell the story anyway like that's that's insane and that so listen am i judging her personally am i saying like she's an evil i'm not saying she goes home and kicks her dog in the face every day but i'm saying what she is participating in in her professional life is something morally repugnant and like that's how i feel about the highest levels of government and media that there's just this mass compliance now and by the way there's also i'm not trying to get like all Alex Jones on you here, but like there is. What do you think about the atrazine and the water supply? Has that it I don't. Feminized I don't know any yet? of that stuff. Okay. But uh, I, I have read. I think he was not completely wrong about the frogs. But whatever. Uh, that's a whole different How thing. How gay are but they? But listen, really? they look. Bohemian Grove is real. Yeah, okay. They Bohemian, do weird yeah. things there. So I don't yeah. know exactly what's going on with these people, and I don't like don't they to do the conspiracy of thing. Sort of empathy? Yes. Yeah. They, and I don't like to jump down conspiracies that I can't prove. But it's it is totally reasonable to look at like the Epstein thing, to look at Bohemian Grove to look at these things and go, yeah, there's something going on here that's pretty weird. Okay, like, but my, my point, Dave, is that if you are looking at it as if this is because we're all ruled by some satanic cabal, and I'm I know not that's not that. exactly what you're saying, yeah. but you're kind of saying like, Bohemian Grove, they get together. It's You're these, winking yeah. in that direction. Uh, right? It's, it's uh, the, the problem with that, if it's wrong, which I th- think that it kind of is, is that... It but supposes that the solution is to clear out this corrupt class but what, and replace them. What am I wrong them. about? In what I just said, like, what's wrong about what I just said? What's what? What I'm saying is it's structural. It's not. It's primarily structural. And where I think you're right is that sometimes the inset. You know, Hayek even had an essay about this: why the worst get to the top. And it's like because the incentives of power do dr- tend to draw certain personalities. So y- you might even be right that there's a disproportionate amount of sociopaths or psychopaths, uh, just like there are in corporate America. Yeah, well, it's, why there's, there's right? lot, it's why there's so many pedophiles who are, are uh, baseball coaches or literally coaches. That's why there's, there's so many, you know, like uh, abusive people who are cops because these positions draw in those type of people, right? I mean, that's it's part of the natural cycle of but it. But where I think it gets, um, where the where the populists um, muddle this message is like, we have this, uh, you know, shadowy class of rulers that once we defeat them and clear them out, it's all going to be okay. But well, the reality that. is that it's the power structure itself that oh, yeah. is the problem I com- I that needs to that. be. And, and I think but that- But both can be true at the same time, right? Yeah. So like, I think both of those things are true. I think, yes, it's like power corrupts. This is, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, and that's and that's basic. a big part of it. Right. Um, and, and just like you said, it's like this whole thing. This, so I'm not like one of these. See, this is what I think is so stupid about the kind of like, uh, um, I don't know, like the, the kind of, I'm I'm not alt-right, but like whatever that whole bigger right-wing world is and their critique of libertarians is basically like, no, 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 we just got this bad group in right now. If we get them out, then we can have the government, you know, run for Christians or whatever their plan is. No, no, this is stupid because it is, like you said, it's inherent in the structure. It's not only stupid, it's dangerous. Look, the the mix of democracy and big government, look at it, obviously, what? What does it incur? What does it draw out of every politician to say the most dumbed down slogan to play to the most uninformed voter to just say the stu- this is why Donald Trump did so well because Donald Trump was like I'll do you one better I'll talk like a kindergartner and just say this I'll just say everything's terrific or stupid and, get, and but really it's not as if there any was, of the others are much better than that. There was but one that- speech that I was writing about where he was talking about um, how you have to flush the toilet 10 to 15 times nowadays. So low flow toilets, he was talking about how you have to run your dishwasher like 15 times. And at the end of this uh, whole rant, 
he said, housewives vote for me. And I just love that agree to it's like so many yeah. other politicians, it would be this like, that would be implicit. And Donald Trump is smart enough to just make it a fucking explicit yeah. call to action. Housewives vote for me. Yeah. I critiqued the toilets. Like I critiqued run, the dishwasher. Like he's run his own dishwasher in, in but, 60 But it's also years. like, I, you know, it's, it's total exaggeration. Also, I get where he's talking about with like the dumb environmentalist restrictions, just make everyday life a little bit worse in so many ways. Yeah. And that's kind of what a lot of the progressive left wants. I'm sorry, but like I chafe every single time I get like a paper book bag in the grocery store versus a fucking plastic bag because it's just a matter of like why is it that we're there's a huge contingent that's just trying to make everyday life a little bit worse and donald trump i think very successfully tapped into that yeah 100 uh, but, but i, I but love it the does, explicitness but of then so you're so you're gonna have this whole dynamic of like power look by definition almost polit politics is going to attract people who want to rule over other people. So that's already, that's what the magnet is there. And then of course, it's re the problem, it's this mix of big government and democracy, which are very related, right? So you have to appeal t to a, a population who by, again, by definition, are only a very small percentage of them are gonna know much about politics because that's true about everything. Like that's true about anything. Like that's true, only a small percentage of people have e expertise in any field, right? So then you have that and then because the government's so big, there is so much power being wielded that it's inevitably completely corrupted. I mean, the what is our federal government gonna spend this year? I think over $6 trillion. If you're, mo if you're spending $6 trillion, somebody is going to be like actively lobbying yeah. to get that but, power. But Dave, so this is uh, what, this is the danger that I see in the populist strategy is that this right wing that you mentioned, um, that it does exist, the the nat cons or whatever we want to call them, that they just want to install their version of a virtuous leader to impose their vision of the world. And that is what that that's their analysis is that that we have these these um corrupt uh, degenerates running the government and we need, you know, good virtuous, uh, Caesars or whatever running the government. And I worry sometimes that the populist strategy and libertarianism is, uh, trying to cultivate that and it's strengthening it. And, and this is like a pattern you see throughout history is the socialists wreck things. And then the right wing, you know, fa fascists or whatever you, uh, whatever form they take then comes in and imposes right wing dictatorship or whatever. And that unless, you know, you, you M Malay is a kind of interesting example because he's, he's coming in, uh, on, on to, to fix what the socialists have done and the Peronists have done, um, but he's extremely explicit about who the enemy. Yeah, I mean, is we'll see again. Like by the way, we'll see how he does. Yeah, we don't, I don't know, know if he's, he's the real deal or exactly. I'm saying he said this yeah. stuff and he won on that. So right. that in itself is interesting. So I basically, I think you're almost exactly right there, right? Like that kind of tends to be like this pattern that's played out over and over again, which is like, and you could see this, um, like where there'd be these awful uh, right wing movements as a response to communism, like all throughout the world in the 20th century. And look, man, like I, I think almost to me, that's why you need this libertarian populism even more, because that's one of the most important components to put out this right wing fire, because there is something really dangerous there too. Like, I mean, I, I think about, I, was, I remember saying this on uh, Rogan's podcast a few appearances back, where I was like, I almost like, you know when you'll see these things, like the craziest of the woke, whatever the craziest woke thing is, you know, they're just like, there, we've, there, we're, gonna convince this three-year-old boy he's a girl or like there's like um, some you know like drag queen giving a lap dance to like a seven-year-old or something the lady and rabbi I, on tv talking about the you know glory of hamas but she had like a beard yeah like there's like, whatever but you see it and it's you're almost like it's like my first thought is like whoa that's really insane and awful and then like your immediate second thought is like oh my god we're gonna live under a right-wing dictator because my God, like what the backlash to this is going to be. And it's usually not going to be some right winger who's like going to be like, well, listen, you have your right to be a transgender person. Just maybe we shouldn't push this on kids. It's going to be someone being like, no, you don't have a right to do this. And, you know, and so the libertarian thing there is like you got to kind of like try to to harness that populist energy, but in an explicitly libertarian way, yeah. talking about that. It's like, no, like the only answer here. And, and this is kind of to me the great libertarian insight, right? Because like fundamentally, we're kind of like a compromise. That's kind of like what libertarianism is. It's it's almost like, no, call a truce. Like, that's it. Like, you don't get to impose your view on them and they don't get to impose their view on you, but you both get to do what you want to do, right? Like with your own lives. But that's kind of the thing that, 
the 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 insight is that it's like that's actually also better for you. Mm -hmm. Like in the long run, you attempting to impose your view on other people is going to end up in them trying to do the same thing to you, and everybody loses. The thing that I would also add to that, though, is that just because I, I totally agree with that articulation of what we value as libertarians. The thing that I would add to that though, because there is a little bit of tension within libertarianism about thick versus thin libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And I would say you don't have to be totally agnostic on all cultural issues. I think you um, can't be. Well, so the, the, I'm just the thing that I think about is like, you know, so much of my politics, it's like the state ought to get out of the way as much as humanly possible to allow people to live their lives uh, in accordance with their values and what they see fit. But that doesn't mean that I abdicate you know, my ability to have an opinion about what the good life looks like and what human flourishing is and what types of choices people ideally ought to make to be able to pursue that good life. And 100%. I think that this is sometimes where libertarians get a little bit, um, you know, binary, where there's this idea of like, okay, well, you know, some libertarians sort of gesture in the direction of so much culture war stuff and seem to have a very, um, almost very narrow view of how people ought to live. And I'm not always super confident in their uh, reassurances that state power should never be used to enforce those ends. And that that really gives me the heebie-jeebies. But then there are also a lot of libertarians out there who sort of act like you're in some way a bad libertarian or you err if you have any opinions about what the good life well, looks like. And so I, I, I'm interested both, in carving out this middle both, space. That's kind of on both sides of the libertarian totally. spectrum. And what I've noticed a lot of times on kind of, let's say, on the left side of the libertarian cultural space is that they'll say that but also not recognize that they're doing the exact same thing. Like someone said to me uh, once, I got in this thing, I got all the online uh, prostitutes mad at me because um, I said hey, that- uh, We have uh, our best performing episodes with Ayla, our favorite rationalist prostitute. So, okay, you know, no, I'm not, have... listen, I'm just saying, what someone said to me, I was just responding to someone, is where they said to me, uh, they go, libertarians believe that uh, sex work should be legalized and normalized. Mm -hmm. And I was like, legalized, mm -hmm. sure. Um, not, I don't really agree with you on normalized, um, because I like, I actually don't think it should be normalized or, and you know, they said something like it should be looked at as no different than being a baker or being a this. And I'm like, well, that's never going to happen. That. And then he goes, oh, see, so you're like, you're, you're a libertarian who's trying to fight a culture war. But I'm like, but so are you, you just had the opposite opinion of me. You totally, you totally made an extra libertarian statement there by saying that it should be normalized. The only, if you want to be like, look. We're libertarians, but we're also people. So what libertarianism has to say about it is that it shouldn't be illegal. That's all libertarianism has to say about sex work. But as a person, I could also sit there and be like, well, no, I'm not going to pretend that like if my daughter wanted to go to college to become a surgeon or wanted to be a prostitute, I would have like no feeling about that whatsoever. And that one wouldn't represent that I have totally failed in the most important job that I've ever undertaken. And the and that Being like, a surgeon so isn't that to, bad, I mean, Dave. Going yeah, to medical saying, school isn't that, that helpful. Well, I'm just saying, I, I'm allowed to say that. Yeah. And now I can still say, I don't think the government should like enforce yeah. this on anyone, but what am, I'm gonna sit here and pretend that that wouldn't represent a failure on my part, uh, that, that I wouldn't like, like probably murder to make sure that never happens like i just i think no. what we uh, i think what we run into often at reason tell me if you agree is that people interpret because we work at reason they're like oh reason th this writer or uh video producer is putting out the libertarian opinion on everything so you know we have a bunch of different writers who have bunch of different opinions on social issues and sometimes but, you know, someone will write no, a column right. about something and people will be like oh reason is saying yeah this but that's all of us right yeah. and and kind of to some degree it's fair too but like it's totally fair for you to just be like okay well the mises caucus took over and look what this one account did yeah. or look what this one guy did and then kind of like think of that as the me and that is by the way a lot of why you guys get heat for that is because you are kind of in some way married to the worst of your thing so when for a second which by the way i'm not i'm not trying to knock her I'm not, or anything, because um, again, I don't know her at all, but we had like Twitter back and forth that weren't good. But when Elizabeth uh, um, Nolan, oh, Nolan Brown s tweets out a thing about how the Ron Paul movement, you know, was like all a bunch of racists coming into libertarianism, it's like, okay, so now I'm in a position where I feel that I have to like kind of battle you because I can't just let someone who writes at reason call my people a bunch of racists when I'm like, yo, that's totally not true. And then now, uh, now, now, you know what I mean? It just becomes this thing where it's kind of like, and now you guys fairly or unfairly carry that baggage with you amongst that 
that part of the movement. That that's it's like, well, that's the be. publication who has hires the lady who says the thing. The same way I carry the baggage yeah. with me. Especially I you, Liz, since fairly you were unfairly, both named Liz. Yeah, you know, since I'm the other blonde yeah, Liz yeah. who now writes Roundup, yeah. right? You're I took the over same for person. other Liz. I mean, uh, no, I mean, the... By the way, Liz Nolan Brown does amazing journalism on... Uh, and by the way, I'm sure, I bet I'd agree with 80% yeah. of what she has to well, say. The thing that's so annoying about this is like, I don't know, I'm an individualist, man. I think it is absolutely fair game to hold me accountable for all of the work that I have produced for recent TV and all of the work that I have written and all of the dumb shit that I have tweeted that has come into my brain that I've just thought the world needs to hear. But I do think that there is a little bit of a, I mean, you're correct that we associate, you know, sometimes our, our ideological opponents with, you know, the worst of their crop. But I do also think, you know, we're libertarians and we ought to be individualists at the end of the day. And to some degree, it's like, hold me accountable for the things that I say and believe. And I'm willing to defend. I'm willing to go to the mat to defend the things I believe. But I can't sit here and defend, you know, tweets of my colleagues or tweets of other fellow travelers, even if, you know, I tend to generally like what they, because I also don't know what exactly was going through their minds at that time. And I think that that's like a useful, um, you know, we should all probably carry some amount of intellectual humility with us. And I think, you know, whenever the three of us get into um, the same environment together, or, you know, the two of us go on a podcast together, uh, or the two of us do a live stream together, the thing that is always really like stunning to me is like, there is a lot more that unites us, a lot more shared values sure. than things that, um, you know, divide us. And I think- that Let me really ask you, Dave, cool. about this, because we'll, we have a couple questions to wrap up. And one pertains right to this, this question of making more people libertarian or embracing libertarian ideas. Do you think that most people at their core are libertarian, more libertarian or authoritarian? Um, you know, I don't really know what the answer to that is. And I don't, I don't spend too much time thinking about that. What I know is that I was totally compelled when these ideas were introduced to me and that I know that we're not at our ceiling, you know what I mean? And that I know that I hear all the time, everywhere I go, then I travel a lot. Every single city I'm in, in every single town, every single show, every single speaking event, somebody comes up to me and goes, you're the reason I'm a libertarian. Like you introduced me to this and then I found this and then I found this and then it all made sense. So my thing is like, I wanna make as many as possible uh, or introduce, you know, not just make, but you know what I mean? Like it introduced them to this line of thinking yeah. to as many people as I can. But I also, I'd never in my mind think like, oh, we need to get 51% of the population to be libertarians because then we could win some elections. Because yeah. the truth is that, um, like nations are never moved by 51% of the population. They're moved by a, a small group of people who are dedicated and like get their, what they want to see happen. Um, so I think my thing is like, I think if libertarians were, I don't know how many libertarians do you think there are in the country right now? I, I don't know. But if there's a couple million, maybe, um, mm -hmm. oh, if way we, more than that. Well, how many do you think? I don't know. I think I'm very optimistic. I think no, 60, I mean, like, 70, 80 million. So I you, think people. Do you think there are. No, but I'm not saying like, I'm not yeah. saying like, do you, I don't mean like they, they're a libertarian, but they don't know it. Okay. I mean like they're a libertarian and they know oh, it and they oh, identify yeah, yeah, as yeah. libertarian. Way I'm fewer. saying if, let's say there's, there's a few million, like, could we get that up to 20 million? Like that would be, that would change this country so much. And so like my thing is always just kind of like whatever that number is. Look, the truth is if you talk to the average person on the street, you just, we go stop a random person right here and we go, what do you think of Ron Paul? Most of them won't know who you're talking about. At best, they'd think you're talking about Rand Paul. And they definitely would not be able to really ar articulate and explain to you what the libertarian position is. We still, there's still so many people who have just like never come in contact with a lot of these ideas. So my thing is like, let me try to say it in the most compelling way on the biggest platforms that I can get on and try to get as many new people on board as, as we can. They're like, Ron Paul, is that that YouTuber who sells all the energy drinks, right? <laughs> right. Is, that, is that his dad? Uh, the related question that I have, for all of us, actually, not just Dave, um, is what is your libertarian white pill? Oh, What's the thing that makes you the most optimistic? About okay, well, I'll say things are headed here. Let me uh, let me give the Gene Epstein uh, the Gene Epstein case for radical optimism, which I always love. This just like speaks to my soul. But so this was his thing that he said was he was like, I hope I do it justice. But he was like, okay, if you were sitting around in 1845. And you said uh, to your buddy, you went, you know, I think in 20 years, slavery is gonna be abolished. They'd be like, you're out of your mind. 
like the slave trade is like at the height right now. Like slavery is, it's, it's just been an institution for all of human history. Like what, in what world could you imagine that in the next 20 years across the West and in the United States of America, there's just not going to be slavery anymore. But that crazy guy would have been right. And I think he does one for the Soviet Union too. Like if you had been saying in the 80s, the Soviet Union was just going to be gone within the next 15 years, it'd be like totally crazy. It's like unthinkable and so, pivots yes. in history. And so like, it is not, there, there are moments like that where things that were seen as like just inevitable institutions are just gone and they don't come back, you know? And so I would say right now, like, look, in the year 2002, and I remember, you know, I'm old, uh, me and Zach are old, you're not, but now you're at a point where I could go back 20 years and still I was an adult then. Um, but I remember the whole year of war propaganda leading up to the war in Iraq. And like, that was just it. It didn't matter if you got your news from Fox News or the New York Times or MSNBC or anything, it was just unanimous. You know what I mean? That it was like, hey, they got these nuclear weapons. They're friends with the terrorists. They helped us do 9-11. We can't let them hand these weapons off to the terror, you know, the weapons they don't have to the terrorists who aren't their friends. But they sold the story. And there was just no one else. Like, with, I mean, there were other people, but they didn't have like a platform. But now it's like, you have Joe Rogan and Tucker Carlson, and then just like a million different shows that have, there's shows you don't, we don't even know about that have half a million followers. There's, there's probably 50 shows that we all don't know about with half a million people watching that show all the time. And so much of that, those dissident voices are getting out there now. So I'm like, I think for the first time, maybe in human history, the monopoly of governments over the, the you know, like um, receiving of information has been broken. I think they're freaking out about that quite a bit. But I think this is, see, this is an enormous white pill. And I just hate, I also just hate pessimism. Uh, I hate it. It's like the, sorry, I was going to say, this is more what I say on my show. I was going to say, it's the gayest thing out there, okay, is pessimism. Uh, You're allowed to say that, that on our show. You will probably get hate mail, but I think that's okay. Be fun. I, don't, I don't mean gay like being, okay, anyway. <laughs> Uh, but it's just At like, it's just, I don't, I just think there's like, no, like I got little kids. There's no option for me to be a pessimist. Like, that's just not an option. That's like, you know, the, I use this, uh, example sometimes, but it's like an analogy or whatever thought experiment. But like, it's like, if there were like five men with guns trying to break into my house cause they want to kill my wife and kids and I'm there with, with a gun and I just sit there and just be like, I don't know, man, there's like five of them and there's only one of me. I just, I don't really think I'm gonna win, yeah. you know? It's like, yeah. what? Like, I got a wife and kids, I don't have any option to feel that way. I'm gonna right away start, you know, it's like, okay, what are we doing? All right, get in the attic. I'm gonna snipe them off from here. I'm yeah. gonna, you know, I got a thing of gasoline. I'm gonna make a bomb real quick or whatever, you know? But you're trying something. <laughs> so it's like, you don't have an option to just like feel yeah. bad about the future. Yeah, I mean, my, my white pill is very similar. Uh, you know, I made a, at the end of the decade, I made a kind of like, what was the 2010s all about? And it was called the death of the gatekeepers. That yeah. was when it all started. And during COVID, we saw them try to come back and they certainly did. I think what was revealed uh, in the Twitter files and all that shows how close we were to having that information landscape yeah. kind of captured across all the major platforms. And so didn't happen though. Uh, you know, Elon bought X. He's calls himself a free speech maximalist. I don't think he is, but he's at least but, trying to do yeah, something yeah. different. There's also now technological solutions. Uh, you know, I'm a big Nostra fan. It's a distributed network. I've got a documentary about Bitcoin mining uh, that I'm here in New York for, and that's that's another you know major white pill is the. The loss of control over money. I mean, how much more libertarian like yes. could you get there? So between speech and money uh, being uh, uncontrollable at this point, I'm pretty optimistic. I think for me, it's a little bit different. Um, I like the idea of like the disruption of the information industry, the disruption of the gatekeepers. But I think for me, the thing that gives me the most optimism about the future of libertarianism is actually, oddly enough, the dirtbag left. I think we're currently seeing this weird fracturing of this sort of wokeness culture that I think for a long time had really seized people's hearts and imaginations. And, you know, at, at I'm 27. A ton of people my age were just like totally wrapped up in this. And there was a little bit of this sense. And I know this, you know, analogy has really been used far too much. But the sense of like 
burn the witch and looking for heresy and then trying to stamp out heresy and trying to ruin people's reputations and livelihoods to the fullest extent possible in this almost like as if your your heart was just seized by this fervor, this passion for this you know new religion of wokeness. And I think the thing that we're seeing that is so wonderful now is people are realizing how many false promises that religion, uh, you know, gave them. Uh, they're realizing a lot of the lies there. They're realizing the degree to which some of these mob dynamics can really turn on them. And, and you know, if you're in this constant pursuit of moral purity, where it's not even clear what these morals are based on, boy, have you really uh, been sold a false bill of goods and landed yourself in a very difficult situation. Um, so I, I think the irreverence of a lot of the dirtbag left uh, and the sort of People from within the left who are willing to look at their own side, their own teammates, and say, hey, what you're doing is just crazy. And frequently they'll do so in almost the terms that you're talking about, the ones that you know you use on your podcast and sort of like this boldness, this irreverence. Um, to some degree, I think we're in a moment where like if you would call the 2010s this era of, you know, big, extreme um, overwrought earnestness, I think to some degree the 2020s are thus far the era of like there's absurdism mm. uh, that's on the rise. And I think you see this a lot with Gen Z. You see this a lot with the dirtbag left. And I think that it's actually a really good thing to be able to poke fun at, um, you know, so much of the bullshit that people were peddling in years prior. And I think also to some degree, as people get older and like all of us have kids. And so, you know, whether you like it or not, we have skin in the game. There's more at stake. Yeah. There's a sense of I care what the future looks like. I care that my son has a good life. Um, and I think to some degree, you also see there was, a lot and not just of, care, but like care, like more care than deeply. I've ever care, thought care, cared about anything. I care more ever. about his yes. life being good yeah, than my own life right. being good. I would do anything to right. it. And I think, you know, any parent feels the same way. But I think there's this sense of like, even if it took, you know, millennials or people of our ref generation a longer time to get to that stage, and maybe they did that later, they're doing it. And I think to some degree, you see people who maybe in their early 30s were obnoxious, you know, lefty activists who now are raising kids and seeing kind of the error in their ways and thinking, oh, actually, I suddenly value different things than what I valued before. And I think when kids are taught things that parents disagree with in public schools, or maybe even not things that parents disagree with, but things that aren't phonics and aren't math instruction, there's a certain amount of like, well, an awakening that happens, a sense of like, what lies was I believing and what lies, you know, mm. was I peddling all along? And I think that we're seeing a lot of this wokeness crumbling right now. Um, and I'm kind of delighted by it. I look forward to the ash heap and hopefully people will gravitate toward more freedom, um, you know, and sort of learn the appropriate lessons from that. I don't know if they will. It's, it does seem, so. uh, it seems to me like there's, there's like, um, there's several different layers of like unsustainability with this country right now yeah. like there's like the financial level of like where you could just look at like numbers on paper and be like this can't keep going like i don't know exactly when this Money house of cards falls keep but going burnt, yeah like right? it's like these entitlement programs like just look at the numbers on them this doesn't work and there does seem to me to be something about wokeism that is just inherently uh you know like this this can't continue like this it's just like this might work for the four years you're at college or whatever but like how do you have a life afterward with this and and it does seem to me that one of the big like the one of the big reasons why the the kind of not even right winger but the the anti-woke crowd let's say is is winning in a lot of ways is just because to to be woke is also it seems to be miserable it's like tedious. you're just you're sentenced to like a life of constantly being miserable over this. And whereas like, you know, other people can I, I'm not saying like I politically agree with like uh, the um, like conservatives, but you're allowed to just like have a family and be fairly it's, happy and not like, you know, be at war with every inch of the world. It's a religion with no absolution. It's a religion with no redemption. And I think at a certain point, people get a little sick of that because it's a like you said, it's a miserable way to live. And I don't know, I, at my core, I am a huge optimist and I think people frequently try to do good. And I think people also frequently sort of yearn for, um, a greater, more robust sense of morality than the weird version offered to them by wokeism or wokeness. And so I sort of look at the degree to which some of this is fracturing and splintering, and I begin to feel really good about it. I'm wondering, you know, how much more um, DEI bureaucracy will various industries have to deal with before we essentially realize we're 
paying a ton of middle managers an obscene amount of money and like we actually and I think to some degree these things are related right if yep. if we are thrown into harder financial times whether in terms of um, the amount of money the Federal Reserve is printing and the the amount of money the US government is spending or you know a recession to some degree you know paying six figures to the DI bureaucrat that you just hired doesn't make very much sense uh, and so a lot of this fat gets trimmed I also think yeah. it's related to the question of free speech and free discourse because the ability when there when that scale is tilted by moderation that is being controlled by this apparatus then it makes it harder for just normal people to say that doesn't make sense and yeah. i'm hoping that the the discourse is getting loosened up now and and that people can speak honestly and i mean that that's partly what we want to do with with the show and really appreciate Dave coming to participate in that today. Absolutely. Um, and we will be back here next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern and every Friday, uh, subscribe to the new podcast feed, uh, subscribe to Reason TV to get new episodes. And thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and Facebook page every Thursday and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Friday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.